Welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is a podcast dedicated to helping individuals start and build successful accounting, bookkeeping, and tax businesses. It's here that we have the experts. Each and every week, we're bringing on those individuals that can help us focus on what matters so that we can offer quality accounting services and most importantly, get paid what we're worth. I'm your host, Roger Connect, and for more than 20 plus years, I've been working with accounting professionals to do exactly this. And today we have as a guest, someone I've been looking forward to having on the show. He is a fellow host and a podcast provider. It's Mike Jezel, let's see if I can say this right, Jezel Sheck, and he happens to be a CPA. He has a mission right now where he is hard, working hard to help business owners overcome complex IRS rules and overinflated tax bills so that they can enjoy the fruits of their labor. He has a show, it's called the Small Business uh, Tax Savings Podcast that is something he's been passionate about and been hosting for some time. So Mike, welcome to the show. Roger, thanks for having me. You betcha. This is going to be great. So first of all, one of the things I always like to start with is just getting a little bit of a context as to what got you into accounting, what started you into the tax space. Yeah, I have kind of a, an interesting journey to, to my career and and really had no intentions to be an accountant or do taxes or do anything like that really from the initial beginning. Okay. Um, started my entrepreneur at a pretty young age. So started my first business at the age of 14 and it was all in the online marketing industry and kind of a unique part of that industry. And so I was in the online marketing industry, started my first business at 14, started to go to, I was like, I got to go to college because I need a backup plan. And so I actually ended up selling that first business at the age of 18 for, I think it was like $7,000. I still have the purchase agreement here. And I was just like ecstatic. Like that that was an awesome. I was exit for $7,000. And then just started to dive into other parts of that online marketing industry. I was uh, partnered a few companies, uh, two different companies that we were part of, you know, that focused on online digital type marketing. But all along that whole time, my, my plan was it was to go to school for accounting. And in the, the idea behind that was just like, this is my backup plan. If this whole online marketing industry and where I'm at doesn't work, I need to have something to lean back on. And I knew that accounting was a was a great option because it leads you to different areas in the business world. You, if you want to get into marketing, you can still be an accountant that's in marketing. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of the the route that I ended up going down. And it was kind of funny. Uh, finished school, went got my master's in accounting, got the CPA. I was like, okay, I got my backup plan set forth. And and not shortly after that, I was a partner at an online marketing company and there were seven partners of us there. Wow. And we all were really good at different things that we did. So we had really good media buyer, really good uh, social media uh, purchaser. And we were trying to pull this company into a bunch of different directions. And so it was at that time we said, you know, it doesn't make sense to pull one company in all these different directions. Why don't we just go out on our own doing what we're good at? And that was the opportunity back in 2013 where I started an accounting firm or more so at that time, a bookkeeping firm Mm -hmm. that focused, uh, you know, initially on online marketing industry, just because we had a good reputation there. So it was an area for me to start. So went from online marketing, started in kind of the finance side of online marketing, had a business that we didn't want to pull in different directions, started to fall apart. And that's when I got into actually being an accountant uh, as a full-time gig. Well, first of all, I love the youth story. As a teenager, obviously starting a business, selling the business as a teenager, that's phenomenal. It, it, you know, just that entrepreneurial spirit there is fascinating. But the one thing that I would then also add is I don't know that I can ever say I've met someone like you that as a as an accounting professional, you became a CPA as a fallback. I mean, it's one thing to say you got your accounting degree, you went into accounting, you got the skills. It's one thing to suggest that you, you know, you had that as a as a fallback because you had the the uh, credentials. But to become a CPA, that's fascinating. So I think that's ki- kind of uh, interesting. But your journey to then split that business as you did and start offering bookkeeping services incredibly interesting. How did you then get into the tax side of the business? Because bookkeeping, tax, two totally different things. Yeah, so I had no interest in tax, didn't have much background in tax. Uh, but eventually, you know, I was working with different tax providers as partners because I, I got to the point where it's like, okay, my bookkeeping clients need somebody that I can send them to. Yeah. And so I had a few tax preparers I was working with that would kind of help on that tax side of that business. And I would constantly be reaching out for them for like just little help of questions. Uh, you know, how do I hire my kids in my business? Or, you know, I have a client that's looking to do an S corporation. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And I kept getting answers from everyone that was work, working with that said, it depends. You know, like how my clients looking to hire their kids in the business. How do they do this? And they're like, it depends. And so I got really frustrated with that because I'm like, well, 
I know it depends and I know we need some specifics. Can you at least guide me in the direction so we can at least get the client moving down that route a little bit? And so what ended up happening is I started to do my own research on these types of things. So started to do my own tax planning research, started to get into that area of the business and eventually started to to offer those types of services, um, which leads to you know, future uh, podcast, which is focused on, you know, kind of that tax planning side of the, of, of the business. You know, this is going to be an excellent discussion because I, like you, have had so many of that same similar dis- uh, discussion or experience. You know, you're looking for what is the best practice? What advice would they have? I'm not looking for uh, a specific strategy. I'm looking for a theoretical, here's just an idea. Can we just have a conversation? And it was never as if they had a passionate, this is a go-to best practice. If I were you, this is what I would do. And that's what I was just hoping for. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily direction, but just, hey, let's just hypothetically talk about if you had this situation, what would you do? And yeah, too often they were just too evasive for me. So let's get into a little bit of this tax discussion. I'm excited about this because it's something I'm also passionate about. Uh, I've written a little bit about it myself. And so the first thing I would like to do for our listeners is distinguish between tax preparation and tax planning. How would you describe the difference? Yeah. So, you know, what, what I always tell business owners too is, is tax preparation is just taking information and sending it to the government. So, you know, what did we do last year? Where's your income? What's your expenses? What's all the activity? We're bundling that up nice and sending it up to state agencies, federal agencies, whatever it might be. Tax planning is the thing that we do way before that. You know, we do before year end. We're doing right now in the middle of the year where we're finding strategies. What can we do? What can we implement in our business? What type of strategies can we utilize to make sure that we're paying the least amount in taxes legally possible? So I always say tax planning comes first. That's done, you know, between January and December. Year end hits. Now we're just taking all of that work that we did and all the information and you're doing tax prep, which is actually sending it up to the to the governmental agencies. I love it. Spot on. I, I can honestly say that I've said exactly what you've said almost verbatim. So that's incredible. There's actually a, a kind of a humorous way of I've, of I've for years answered this question. And it's basically December 31st. Everything prior to December 31st, tax planning, everything afterwards, tax preparation. Now, there are a few exceptions, obviously, but the point is, is Mm -hmm. that's conceptually what we're talking about here is what can you do during the course of the year to legally lower your tax liability? And it's becoming familiar with the tax codes, having this tax strategy strategist that can give you ideas, suggestions on things that you can do within the business to legally limit your tax liability. And so that's where I think it gets fun. It's creative. I think there's this space where you can actually have different ideas and discussions, all with the idea of what can we do to legally lower the taxes. So let's have a conversation about both personal and business. Um, Is there a particular one that you prefer working in as to uh, where you like to strategize? Yeah, most of our work is done on the business side. So, you know, helping business owners, regardless of their size, uh, where we can help them out. Uh, We do do sometimes work with an individual uh, on tax planning. Usually they're going to be a higher net income earner, uh, you know, a higher net worth individual that that has some more advanced type planning. But, you know, 95% of the teachings, the trainings, what we do is all focused on the small business owner. Okay. I was coincidentally at a conference just a few weeks ago where we were hearing and learning different tax strategies. There was a claim at one point that there's just uh, a little bit over a hundred different tax strategies that you can really leverage. I'm just kind of curious, do you have some go-to tax strategies that you like to assess and evaluate and maybe consider? Yeah. Well, you, when we look at tax planning, we break up tax strategies into two different compartments. We call what we call core okay. tax strategies and advanced tax strategies. Core tax strategies, we say, are available to everybody and anybody, regardless of your size. Okay. And so examples of like a core tax strategy would be uh, maximizing deductions, S-corporations, hiring our kids, you know, setting up retirement plans that make sense. Um Kind of in that in that realm of you know whether you're making ten thousand dollars a year or a million dollars a year, these are strategies that you can utilize. So, um, you know, one of my favorite strategies when we talk about tax planning, this is not necessarily a strategy, but just a mindset shift. Okay, is this idea of maximizing deductions? So many accountants, so many people out there, when they're talking to business owners and they talk about maximizing deductions, the concept is is hey, it's getting close to the end of the year, you have a big tax liability coming up go buy a new truck or go buy a new piece of equipment when the client might not even need a new truck. They might not need a new piece of equipment, but they're just doing that for the tax deduction. And so what I say is that's, that's not what I call maximizing deductions. When we look at maximizing deduction, we're saying 
let's look at spending that you're already doing. Let's look at everyday spending that you're doing. How can we move money that's already been taxed into a business expense, find a business purpose for that spending and get a business deduction for it? That's what I consider maximizing deductions. So if we just take one example, Mm -hmm. hiring your kids, everyone's supporting their kids. They're paying for baseball camps. They're paying for them to go to water parks with friends. They're, They're doing all that. Uh, but usually they're spending, they're taking after tax dollars for that. They're just whatever money they make, then they're using that to spend on their on their children. But how could we find a way that our children can do work in our business? We can pay them for that work that they're doing for us in our business, and then they can go out and use that for those extracurricular activities if if they if they so wish. And so that's just that concept of saying, okay, in that scenario, we're not spending any more money by doing that. So, Mike, you were just describing a few cost savings things that we could do as core uh, core savings. Uh, you were bringing up the children. I just recently, with my uh, own client, was having a conversation with them about their three daughters that they use, and they have them in the office utilizing a few things. But one of the things I've noticed is I've had conversations with clients about this is sometimes they're wondering, well, that's great that I can do a tax savings employing my client, my children, but there's an age thing, you know, how young can they be? And then there's also a skill thing. What do I have them do? You know, I'm, I'm a professional service. What am I going to have them actually do to contribute to the office? And so I know modeling has come up on a few occasions. Obviously, modeling doesn't take the skills necessarily of, of uh, you know, technology and so forth. It's just stand there and look cute like so many kids do. And so some of them have actually utilized modeling as a justification for compensation. The other has actually been uh, social media. They, the younger generation that is, especially the teenagers, they have a, a special aptitude, a real quick attentive to, uh, they're really attentive to what it is that you can be doing in some of the social media platforms to kind of market and leverage the company. And I've seen some of my clients do that with their clients. Do you have any other examples that you've seen individuals actually use their children for in business? Yeah, no, I get that question a lot. They're like, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm an attorney. Yeah. What could, what could my child possibly do for my business? <laughs> no, a paralegal, right? Yeah. I got a 10 year old paralegal. You need to think a little bit deeper. Um, yeah. You know, I love the social media one, and the client then comes back to me and says, I grow by referral base only. I don't need social media. I don't need to do marketing. But I'm like, well, let's think about this. If, they happen to do some social media. Is it? It's not going to hurt you, but we're looking at the benefit that you're now providing your children and the, and the, the tax benefits that we're going to get from that. You know, cleaning the office might be another option. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's. I, I said, let's. I can find something that a child, say seven years or older, can do in every business. It's just having to be a little bit unique of it. Now. Are we going to be able to pay them ten, twelve thousand dollars a year when they're seven years old cleaning the office? Probably not. Like we're not probably going to hit the marks that we want to hit or the the maximum amounts that we'd want to hit necessarily at every age level. But there's going to be some work at every age level that we can find. Stuffing yeah. envelopes, doing those types of things. Lots of lots of unique things that we can do. Yeah, and you know the kids do still have school, so it's not like they need a forty forty hour work week. So. That's what we want there. All right. Uh, you also were talking about the core things. And when I have conversations about the core, there are a few things that I typically bring up. I'm just kind of curious if you'll add to the list. You've got the 401k, the HSA, the uh, the college fund for the, the kids. Uh, there's just a few good tax strategies that you can utilize there as you're setting aside uh, money for retirement and so forth. What other core things would you also include as being those obvious places that an individual could be maximizing, a business should be utilizing? Yeah. The first point we always say is what's the foundation of your business? So do we have an LLC set up? Do we have a potential corporation set up? Are we looking into an S corporation? If we are an S corporation, are we running it properly? Are we taking a reasonable salary? Is that reasonable salary too much? Is that reasonable salary too low? Um, so, you know, when we look at core tax strategies, what are we looking at? Um, exactly. Like you mentioned retirement planning, are we looking at an S corporation or at least evaluating our entity? S corporations, not to make sense for everybody. We're not going to want to rush into it, but are we at least evaluating our entity? I think that is a strategy in and of itself. Um, the maximizing deductions one is something that can go very widespread. You know, um, just as an example, you might want to buy your team a bunch of iPads for, for a, you know, Christmas gift for that. Okay. Well, if we do that, you know, that's over the gift limit and you know, that's a, a quite do- dollar amount that doesn't make sense, but could we load those iPads with educational content and say, okay, here's your new educational learning system that we're going to use. And as part of that, we're going to provide our team with iPads. And so it's getting creative with that maximizing deductions piece of saying, okay, how can we 
find a creative way to make this make sense, to make sure that we're getting a business deduction for this, you know, taking advantage of the home office, making sure we're utilizing, you know, automobiles in, in a way that makes sense. Sometimes we look at the 14 day home rental or Augusta rule. Yeah. So all of these are kind of what I call, what I say, core strategies. And by core, it, it just means that there's something that regardless of your business size that you can be implementing. When we look at advanced planning, advanced planning is typically going to be reserved for those high income earners, the people that are making three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars or more, where those strategies are going to start to come into play. Core tax strategies, regardless of your size, we're implementing them. All right. So now let's go into those more advanced strategies for the um, for the oh the word uh, just escaped me. It's a uh, it's something investor. It starts with an A. Accredited? Accredited. There we go. So you've got the accredited uh, um, investor that's actually a high income earner. All of a sudden, they're at that point where they're considering different strategies. Uh, what strategies do you consider at that point? What things are you looking for that might help them? Uh, whether it's investment, uh, is it you know conservation easements plans? You know what what are you going to throw into the mix? Yeah. So when we get to advanced level, what we always say is from an advanced standpoint, typically they're going to be a little bit more complex strategies, a little bit harder to understand. There's going to likely be some type of investment, whether that's a piece of property, something like that, that we're investing in, mm -hmm. or we're investing in some type of legal structure, something that needs to be set up. Yeah. And so advanced strategies are really going to depend on, okay, where's your income level? Are you in the $500,000 range? Or are you in the $3 million range? Is this just a one-time activity? So are you Good. just selling your business for a one-time gain? Yeah. That's going to change this, the picture a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking at all, all sorts of things, you know, conservation easements, Something we've explored in the past, no longer a valid option that, that's even out there after the, the new tax law that passed at the end of last year. Yep. Um, but when we took at advanced planning, the, there, there's two things that we always look at. First one, is it legal? You know, that, that, that has to be the first step. And we'd ever, never advise someone that's, that's doing something or advise a strategy that's not legal. But the second step is, are we doing it right? You know, if we just look at conservation easements as an example, okay, there are some people out there that did conservation easements really, really well. They dotted their I's, they crossed their T's, they set these things up really well. There's the vast majority of the industry that really abused the tax law in that case. So when we look at advanced planning, we say, okay, is it legal? Great. Let's, let's get past that mark. Second, are we working with a provider that we know is doing things the correct way? They're dotting their I's, they're crossing their T's. You know, if we're looking at a cash balance plan for a retirement option, are we making sure that they're doing the legwork to do it right from the beginning? That's the second P, and that's the, that's the hardest part to overcome. Because as a business owner, as an accountant, you have to do a lot of due diligence with the people that you're working with to ensure that, hey, we know, like, and trust them. We know that they're doing things the correct way. Um, you know, I would say... Something that comes into to advanced, and this is not necessarily um, has to be a high income earner, but is is the whole real estate. You know, how do we use real estate to 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 take advantage of our, our, our tax advantage of that too? A lot of times when we talk about tax planning, though, it's it's are we are we also if we're investing in real estate, are we doing it just for tax purposes, or are we doing it for growing our wealth and finding different purposes to it? Because if you start to just chase things just for the tax savings, you know, that, that stuff's going to come back to bite you at some point or not be as fruitful for you as if we're looking at it from an incomplete picture. You know, are we looking at these strategies as a whole and how they can help us not only save taxes, but grow wealth, make more money, be more successful? Yeah. I liked how you brought in the real estate component because there is a conversation to be had about short-term rentals, rental properties, commercial properties. There's different things you can do there. And I agree, uh, if you're chasing a lot of them, you're getting too diversified. I think you need to become pretty specialized in some of these areas so that you can actually have a familiarity with them. Um, you didn't mention 1031 exchanges, so I don't know if you have anything you want to add there. But I do want to have a conversation about uh, the difference between being rich and wealthy, uh, particularly generational wealth type situations. Uh, with those types of individuals, you know, it's nice to be working with somebody that's making six, seven figure incomes that's consistent and they've got a certain lifestyle. There's another thing to suggest that you're working with individuals that are not just rich, they're wealthy and they're actually looking at generational wealth strategies. Do you have a distinction between the two of those or any insights that you could add? Yeah, I think when you're looking at that, um, you know, from a tax planning standpoint, you know, those people that are generational wealthy. Traditionally, they're going to they, they get there sometime. It, it, you know, it depends on who you're working with. Are you working with the, the multi-generation, the third generation in, the fourth generation in? Mm -hmm. 
or are you working at the creator, the creator of that generational wealth? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think most of the work that, that I do when I'm working with small business owners, traditionally we're working with those creators. You know, yes. we're working with those people that came from nothing, built a small business up, started to become rich, and now they became rich and now they're looking at generational wealth. And so yes. it from an accountant standpoint, I, I think the key is, is to, well, you need to be that resource for your clients that you can be that kind of quarterback to their situation. You know, you need to know when, what you're good at, what you can really help out with, but also where they need to get some outside counsel and being able to work with that outside counsel to make sure that you're providing a similar uh, you know, point of view and, and you're working together instead of having the client here from five different directions, do this, do this, do this. And now the client's having to make that decision. You know, to me, when we look at generational wealth, you're talking about a team, you're talking about a, a family office of people that are working together for that family. They're coming together with ideas and then they're bringing it to the client and saying, Hey, you know, I think this is a great idea. The lawyer disagrees with it. So instead of having the client deal with that conversation yeah. with the lawyer and the accountant are going to work that out and then come to the client with a, with a resolution based on that conversation. Yeah. I like that strategy approach because really the client at the end of the day, they do need to make the decision, but we need to help kind of minimize the options, get the, the cream to the top there. Um, mm -hmm. Who's on that team. You've got the lawyer you mentioned, you've got the accounting professional, you've got what a CFP perhaps. Is there anyone else that you would include? Yeah, financial planner, I think insurance, um, okay. depending on what type of business you're in, having having a, a good insurance agent for both personal and business is important. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's kind of, you know, a consultant or a coach of some sort, if that's, you know, something that's that's relative in your business. You know, we have a, a couple families that are, are close friends of ours that, that just recently came into some generational wealth or have a business family business that sold and, and lead to some generational wealth. And some of the things that we've been talking with them about is they're bringing in coaches to come tell the family members, especially the children, you know, how do you go? How do you move forward from here? Because, you know, you might be in, in this case, we had a, a someone that was 12 years old when they sold the business. And that person is, you know, th they don't need to work ever again in their life. But what does life look like for that? And so th there's there's some coaches that come along, depending on where you're at on that level of generational wealth, yeah. they can come and advise, you know, what are you doing with your time? Because there's so many people have this massive exit and then they're sitting there like, okay, I've worked so hard all my life. Or if you're if you're the recipient of a, a parent or someone else that, that, that created that wealth, you know, you, what do you do now? What's that next step? And and I think that there's a lot of coaching that, that can be done there um, for people that have gone through that same situation. I loved how you described it because I happen to actually know someone that is in that uh, realm where he does the coaching for families that are Love experiencing it. generational wealth. And it's, an, it's a fascinating conversation because what you're experiencing is the creator, as you described it, has worked so hard. They've gone from poverty to wealth, let's say, and now they're in a position where they want to see this extend, but they're considering how's this going to impact my children as their character development, who they are as human beings, and what they're going to play as a role. And generally speaking, the second generation, they can, uh, you know, certain individuals can find themselves rising to the top and being part of that business structure. But at the third, fourth generations, they seem to be so distant from, you know, mom and dad growing the business to grandpa growing the business. And all of a sudden, they're just seeing the wealth, but they're not seeing the business and their role perhaps in that. And so like you described, what they speak of is just like you and I would go to a family reunion, they go to a family reunion slash retreat and they bring in experts and they go through trainings and the youth are actually kind of schooled and uh, tutored into this whole idea of how to have that business mindset. And they get a totally different exposure that I think a lot of us would expect, especially that I did with my own children, because it's kind of like raising royalty. You're preparing that next generation for this role that they're going to take in life and business. And it's an it's fascinating what that world looks like, and uh, it, I find it very intriguing. So yeah, it's so vital, and I, and I think not only just for the, the the people that you know the the generations after you, yeah, but even for the the owner, you know, at some point, if it's a business sale that they sold off and, and made a bunch of money, and now they're going to have generational wealth, the owner is also in a tough position because hey, they've worked really hard for this. Now their business, they wipe their hands clean, they sit on a pile of cash. What do they do? You know. Us entrepreneurs, we're not used to not working. We, we can't just go from working really, really hard and building something incredible to just 
stop and not do anything. We're not we're not tailored that way. So it's important to have that transition phase, you know, at the early start of that generational wealth, having a transition that, that adapts everybody ready for what they have coming to them. Yeah, you kind of alluded to this earlier when you were talking about these people that have that one time flash in the pan, uh, let's say a sell of a business, a large sum of money comes in, it's not going to be perpetuated over time, but there's a tax strategy associated with that uh, large sum of money. Well, there's also a lifestyle that's associated with that. And as mm. you pointed out, that creator, that passionate entrepreneur that built a business, they were very much go getters. And all of a sudden, when the business sells, their lifestyle is totally different because their sense of purpose and being is is more or less challenged. You know, why do I get up in the morning? Mm -hmm. And uh, on the broker side, on the business consulting side, which I'm involved in, there's this continual discussion about, yeah, it's great that you sold the business for a large sum of money, but then what? And it's helping the business owner transition into this new lifestyle and find purpose again. Uh, there's too many stories of them going into states of depression simply because of the fact that six months later, they don't have a reason to get out of bed. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. They haven't gotten out of their pajamas yet. I mean, there's just crazy stories. And coincidentally, I have uh, near me a neighborhood wherein there's some multimillionaires there's a gentleman there that just sold a business for 1.2 million or billion, I'm sorry, 1.2 billion. And from that, he ended up as take home about 450 million because it was two people, two partners. And uh, he's got 450 million, I think, that he's sitting on. It's fascinating to see what he's doing with his life. He's in his uh, late 30s, if I remember right. So, wow. yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy what goes on in the world in some people's lives and being tax preparers and such. It's kind of fun to be on that side to help with the strategies of it all. So I, I like this conversation, as you can tell. Um, mm -hmm. let, let's have a conversation about your journey into doing a podcast. Um, you obviously were very involved with the accounting, the bookkeeping, the tax side of the business. Uh, we've talked about the difference between tax preparation and tax planning, but you actually transitioned out of doing that and found a new passion. Why the transition? Why, why did you leave what you were doing and what are you doing now? Yeah. So it was kind of funny. Um, I, we had a team member that said, Hey, why don't you, you know, we, we did some videos on YouTube, things like that. And they said, why don't you put these on a podcast? So I was like, I don't listen to podcasts. I wasn't a podcast person at that time. So I took three videos, put them up on a podcast, small business tax savings podcast, and, and just let them sit there. And as about six months later, I had was starting to get some emails come in and say, hey, I listened to your podcast, really love this topic. I'd love to connect with you on it. And, and I'm thinking, I'm like, what is it? What are they talking podcast? What are they talking about? <laughs> and, and it started to click and was like, wow, like maybe we're on to something here. And from that point forward, we've been doing weekly episodes ever since. And so really just my passion is, is to try to, you, you hear from so many accountants that it depends on. Uh, idea. Lawyers are the same way. It's always, it depends. And so my, my, my strategy with the podcast is just to provide a ton of values, a ton of content to get through 90 to 95% of that strategy. I know every strategy, everything, it depends and it's important, but 90% of every tax strategy is relatively the same for everybody. And then we're just tweaking that strategy a little bit at the end to make it custom to you. If we look at hiring your kids, the concept of hiring your kids is the same for every single person. Now that little bit of what is that kid, what is that child going to do? How much are we going to pay him? That's where you're tweaking it for that little bit. So my goal with the podcast is let's get 90% of the way there. And that's, you know, kind of what, what has led us to just continue to do those weekly episodes. We do videos. Now we do a, a blog post with every topic we do. Um, and then obviously the audio version as well. I love it. Well, there are so many different strategies. As you mentioned, there's these core ones, there's the more aggressive ones. The Just the idea of being able to hear different perspectives and applications of these, I think is powerful. And you and I both know you run into the, the situation where every year these can change, you know, how the code is being mm -hmm. interpreted and how the laws have been written can change. And when those changes occur, everyone's struggling to see its application in their business. And so it's very topical, very, very important. And I see either as a tax preparer, a tax planner, or even as a business owner, an excellent podcast to listen to just simply because of the fact that these are insights that you can perhaps use personally. Um, I, on a personal note, you just moved into a new house. You've got your children. Uh, what do you think your um, family is seeing from you or learning from you as you've gone on this entrepreneurial journey? What do you hope they've learned? 
Yeah, I mean, my my kids are young, so you know, I don't think they see see much of the 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 journey up to this point. Um, but my goal is to to kind of have them get a different insight up to this entrepreneurial journey. All of my career, I've worked virtually 100% from home, and I've always made it a passion that the weekends are for family. The weekends we don't do work unless you know something crazy happens, which is kind of a change in the accounting industry. Now, I don't have, I never worked for an accounting firm. I never worked for a public accounting firm. So I don't have that kind of core knowledge of this is how we do it. We work 70 hour weeks during tax season or whatever it might be. And I think that provides some good value when I started my firm because I didn't bring any of that baggage yeah. with me of, of saying, okay, this is how we do things. At, at the same time, I didn't bring any of that baggage with me. So there was a lot of learning that I had to do of how do we run an accounting firm? So there, there was some, some obstacles that we had to accomplish there. Uh, but I think ultimately, you know, with this, this range of entrepreneurship is just showing people that if you work hard, if you work smart, you don't need to spend 80 hours a week in your business in order to see that fruit. You can do it in less time. I like that. You know, I just had a conversation yesterday with a firm owner of a tax firm, and uh, he shared with me that in his entire practice, he actually had last tax season, the average tax preparer worked 42 hours uh, a week, work it. week. And he was very excited about the fact that he was able to offer that to all of his preparers. And they met their goals. They processed the returns as they expected. So he was very pleased with the tax season and having not required more than those 42 hours that ended up being worked. And then likewise, I know of another individual that uh, she ended up in her tax business taking a vacation in the middle of the tax season. She was very excited about planning it in the sense that she wanted to see she could do it. She wanted to prove to herself that she could break away and she did. And she still had an amazing tax season. And I think that what you're describing is kind of a paradigm shift in it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be long hours. It's supposed to be difficult. We're supposed to lament it. And what I'm finding is that there are individuals out there that are definitely trying to break away from that norm or that that stereotype. So I like that point. Um, here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to kind of summarize our conversation here and come back to you for a closing thought. But I'm, I've really appreciated this conversation. There's a few things that I'd like to kind of point out, though. First of all, as a listener, definitely check out the episode description. You're going to find there some information regarding Mike's podcast and how it is you can actually listen to it and definitely subscribe. So I want you to check that out. Obviously, if you're enjoying today's discussion, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to like and subscribe this podcast. Make sure you put that as your favorites and get notified as to when it comes out each and every week. But as to the episode, I do want to mention that uh, this has been a conversation from Mike's entrepreneurial beginning as a teenager, getting that bug as to what he can do in life. And by 18, selling a business for a sizable sum. I mean, $7,000 today, even as a kid, would be a nice little uh, uh, take home. That's hugely a, a, a thing to celebrate. But then to actually find himself starting a bookkeeping business. And as a bookkeeping business, going out there and servicing the e-commerce space, I think that's powerful. You know, we have conversations about niching and so forth. And so he obviously was able to focus and go deep. But then to, at that same time, really dive into the tax side of things. And we had conversations about core strategies, what you can be doing with those that are a little bit more, um, let's say, uh, advanced in their incomes and earnings strategies that we can talk about is for wealth generation and generational uh, wealth. The idea of leveraging, let's say, your children as a strategy. Th these things are things that I think are fun. They're exciting. They're creative. And I enjoy these conversations because I think many of our clients that we're working with can actually benefit from them in a legal way to lower their tax liability. And so that's something that I definitely want to stress. And then ending on this note of we don't have to be, as accounting professionals, taking it in a very negative way every time we go into tax season with this lamenting attitude of woe is me it can be something that we can still do with a good amount of zeal a good amount of energy but not not make it be a way of uh, kind of beating ourselves up so uh, with all that being said excellent conversation covered a lot of topics mike what would you like to end with yeah, I, I would just like to say, you know, if, if I could go back and start my accounting firm over from the beginning, I would have it with the end in mind of, you know, how do I start this thing where I can grow it and also not have to overcome as much as a business owner? When we, as accountants, we put so much pressure on our shoulders. You know, we get into this firm, we just like, we need new clients, we need money in the door somehow, some way. But what that does, it is also makes us the center of that firm. 
And those clients that we get, they want to work with us. Those everybody that we get into that firm, they want to work with us. Whereas if we know at the beginning of starting this firm where we want to end up and we don't want to be that center of attention, we don't need every client to be coming to us as their sole source. Uh, there's a lot of planning that you can do from the beginning. So if I could start that whole journey again, that would have been the first step I took is saying, OK, let me think about how I can build this firm without the clients needing to interact with me. Now, I know at the beginning, you're going to have that opportunity. You're going to have that situation where you're working very heavily with your clients. But there's going to become a time when you don't need that to happen, when you're going to have such a good team around you that you've trained, that you've put together to do those types of things where you don't need to be that single one source, but your team can help with that. And that transition is much harder when you don't have that, that foresight at the beginning. I love that. Excellent advice. You know, just beginning with the end in mind, a good uh, Steve Coveyism that's worth noting. And uh, your exit strategy, you know, you've got to have in mind what you're going to do to build a business that is autonomous from you in the day to day operations. And I agree with you. So wonderful uh, ending point. So here's what I'm going to do to wrap this up. First and foremost, again, if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. Go back and binge listen to the various episodes that we have uh, covered with the experts as it applies to your working on your business to, in fact, have the premier accounting firm in your area. At the same time, I want to invite you to join us at GrowCon. GrowCon is an annual conference for owners of accounting, bookkeeping, and tax businesses that you do not want to miss. It's from the stage that we hear from the experts. You also go to visit with your peers, hear from those that are doing exactly like you are, and more importantly, from those that are actually ahead of you and leading the way so that they can mentor you in your journey. Uh, with that, you also get to meet the Universal Accounting team. And as we always say, help yourself actually be in business so that you can be successful but not be alone. So all that being said, check out GrowCon. Also realize this, if you would like more information about these principles that we discussed today and how you can actually apply them in your life, in fact, becoming uh, a certified professional tax preparer, check out Universal Accounting School. You can go to universalaccountingschool.com or give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and have a great day.